Hi, everybody. Welcome to worship this morning on Sunday, May 17th here at Emmanuel Lutheran Church. Wherever you are when you're watching this, whenever it is that you're watching it, it's really good to have you here as we gather together as one people of faith united in Jesus. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Throughout this month of May, we've been talking about something called lament. Lament is this ancient practice of bringing your your complaints, your pain, your sorrow, your, your sadness to God, and then asking God to do something about it, and then praying for the strength and the peace and the faith to, to keep on trusting God day by day, moment by moment, even when we don't have all the answers, even when we don't fully understand what's going on. Surely this is a time for lament. We're all feeling grief and and sadness. We're all mourning things, some things that are big and some things that are small, things like just the, the disruption of our daily lives, the brokenness we see in, in our world around us. This is a time for lament. Now this week I saw a comic, and the comic was a picture of a woman sitting next to Jesus, and the woman opened her mouth to pray, but but all that came out was sort of like this deep sigh. And the woman turned to Jesus and said, I'm sorry, Jesus, let me explain what I mean. And Jesus said, no, it's okay. A sigh can be a prayer too. I don't know about you, but when I pray these days, it can start to feel overwhelming quickly. There are so many things to pray for. I think about the fact that I wanna pray for healthcare workers and first responders. Everybody who's working right now as an essential worker, keeping our country going and serving us in valuable ways. I want to pray for all the members of my congregation who are on my mind and on my heart. I want to pray for all those who are lonely and feeling sad right now, all those who are unemployed. I think about all those who are sick and how I want them to be made better, Uh, all those who are in positions of power how I want God to give them wisdom and strength to make good, faithful decisions. And before long, it can feel as if my prayer list is far too long for me to ever get through. But that's okay. This morning, Pastor Dan's going to remind us that a sigh can be a prayer too. See, when we pray to God, we're not trying to get God to do exactly what we want. We're not trying to force God to obey our will. Prayer is, above all else, an act of trust. It's telling God, hey, these things aren't okay, and lifting them up to God, trusting that God knows what to do with them. Prayer, above all else, is an act of faith. And today, we're going to learn more about how we can pray in faith, even during times that feel as overwhelming as this. I pray that you'll stick with us uh, during this worship service, that you'll join us in lifting your laments and sorrows to God, that you'll join us as we pray that God does something, and that you'll join us as we entrust those prayers to God, knowing that God is good and that God loves us and God is with us even now. Thanks again for joining us in worship this morning. As we worship, you'll have opportunities to sing and to pray. You'll hear readings from scripture, you'll hear a sermon and a children's chat, and you'll even be invited to give us a response to a question so that we can create next week's worship service together. But wherever you are, just know that we're glad that you're here. We're glad that you're with us. And let us enter into worship now together. Let us pray. O loving God, to turn away from you is to fall. To turn toward you is to rise. And to stand before you is to abide forever. Grant us, dear God, in all our duties your help. In all our uncertainties your guidance. In all our dangers your protection. And in all our sorrows your peace.
Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. From Romans. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay. To decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves. We have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Hallelujah! Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hi, everybody. In our learning about lamentation this month, we've been saying that laments usually follow a three-step pattern or outline, beginning with a protest or a complaint to God about how our lives and world have gone off the rails, including our puzzlement, frustration, and confusion, sometimes even anger, as to why a good and loving God has allowed this to be so. Moving then to petition, asking God to do, for God's sake, something about it, and then concluding with praise, often a recitation of past experiences of God's rescue of people like us from earlier times of distress like this, and an expression of confidence that such a God can be trusted to save us again now. So, protest, petition, praise. And for the last two weeks, my sermons have focused on that opening protest portion of lament, calling it a loud religious ouch, an expression of the spiritual pain we feel when all of a sudden it seems like God is not in his heaven and all is not right with the world or like a wrestling match with God that God both instigates and rather enjoys because it keeps us holding tightly onto God and God holding tightly to us while together we grapple with the issues of life. But now today I want to move on to the middle petition part of lament where we ask God for what we want and need and plead with God on behalf of others. And to do that, I want to call upon the life and guidance of the Apostle Paul, whose words about prayer were in the reading from the 8th chapter of Romans that you heard just before this sermon. In that letter, 
Paul speaks about what he calls the sufferings of this present time, meaning not just the struggles that he personally faced, which were many, not even the struggles that the early church faced, which were also abundant, but the groaning of the whole creation that was waiting eagerly, as Paul said, for God's redemption. This fallen world, groaning like a woman in labor who can't wait for the birth to happen and for the pain to give way to an unimaginable joy. Paul says that that's what it's like to live in hope, hoping for what you cannot see and waiting for it. I guess with what you could call impatient patience. And it's important to note that those words from Paul aren't just the musings of a philosophical mind or a bookish theologian. Paul is speaking here from his own very painful and real experience, which he in another letter lists as having included hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonment, riots, labors, sleepless nights, and hunger. And so when Paul says that in such times of struggle, we may not know how to pray as we otherwise would, and that it's precisely then that the Holy Spirit steps in and intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. We can know that Paul is speaking from his own lived experience, from his own heart. He knew what it was like for the list of prayer needs to grow beyond what your ability is to name them all and what it's like when the things that are happening around you are so unsettling and so far beyond your understanding that you don't even know what you want to ask God to do about it. Paul knew what it was like when your prayer is mostly just a deep and wordless sigh. And more importantly, he also knew what it was like when God answered such prayers. The book of Acts has several such stories that I could choose from, but today I want to share one of them from that book's 16th chapter. Paul is on his second missionary journey, and for the first time he has crossed into Macedonia in modern-day Greece, bringing the gospel of Jesus for the first time onto European soil. In the city of Philippi, he starts a church helped by a successful businesswoman named Lydia. Only trouble soon follows. Following the example of and in the name of Jesus, Paul casts a demon out of a young woman. And you'd think that the people who knew her would be pleased about that. But it turns out that the young woman's demonic spirit gave her the power of divination, a power that others had exploited by turning her into a fortune teller and making quite a decent living for themselves in the process. So, when Paul cast out the demon, out went the fortune-telling, and gone was the income to her owners. And Paul quickly learned that people who willingly tolerated religious debates and discussions by street-corner preachers quickly got very nasty when it interfered with their ability to make money. And since the concerns of people of substantial means even back then got a far quicker response by the authorities than those of less connected and less affluent people, Paul and his companion Silas soon found themselves arrested, beaten with rods, and thrown into prison, their feet fastened in stocks. And so now I'll let Natalie tell you what happened next. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, 
What must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. And that's a pretty amazing story. And you remember how it started when Natalie started reading? It started when Paul and Silas led a midnight prison prayer service. They were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening in. And while the book of Acts doesn't tell us the content of those prayers, I'd be willing to bet my 1956 Mickey Mantle Most Valuable Player baseball card that they weren't praying for an earthquake to come and break their chains and open the door. They weren't praying for the jailer to turn suicidal because he thought they had escaped and he knew that his head would be on the block for it. They didn't pray to decide to then stay put so that they could save not only this jailer's life, but eventually his very soul by telling him about Jesus and converting him to their faith. See, I'm sure they didn't pray for any of that. But that is what God did. That's what God heard in their cries for help and in their sighs, probably too deep for specific words. God heard their prayers and, yes, answered them. By not by doing exactly what they asked, but by doing something far beyond what they could have even imagined. Something wonderful, something creative and life-giving to them and to others. Something new. So, it was the Paul who got arrested and beaten and thrown in jail and then saw what God did to answer his wordless sighs and who had probably a dozen other experiences just like that in the past who then later wrote to the Romans about a Holy Spirit who helps us in our weaknesses and who, when we don't know how to pray as we ought, intercedes for us, steps in for us, and turns our deepest sighs into bright ideas in God's ears. And that, my friends, leads to this advice to you for that petition part of your lament. First, don't worry about being too specific in your praying and what you're asking God to do. Don't try and solve God's problems for God or for you. If by the nature of lamenting, you're already saying that you don't understand why things are the way they are, then why should you expect to know how to make them right again? Or that you'd need to give God instruction on how to fix things? Last week, we asked you to tell us in 10 words or less what you've been praying for most these days. We again received about a dozen responses, only some of which observed our 10-word limit. Most understandably these days, people were praying for protection and continued health for those on the front lines of this pandemic and for their loved ones. Others prayed a bit more broadly for all those who grieve losses, for those alone and isolated, or for our country to find its way, for reason to prevail, and for us to learn from this experience. And there were also a few who kept their petitions more open and broad, expressing deeper desires, but leaving God the room to decide the specifics. And while giving voice to our specific desires is fine when we can name them, and God certainly wants to hear them, it's also good to remember that in times of lament, a deep sigh is also enough. In the year or so before I came to Holden, I was meeting each month with a spiritual director to talk through the unsettledness that I was feeling in my present call and life. 
Through my sessions with him, I developed a three-part pattern of prayer that has stuck with me ever since and that places my life and concerns in God's hands without telling God how to resolve them. Each part of that prayer has just eight words. I begin by praying, draw me to you, O God of grace. And I simply repeat that phrase over and over until the distractions of the day slip away and I find myself in God's lap. Draw me to you, O God of grace. Then I shift to praying, show me your paths, O God of grace. And I repeat those eight words over and over until a variety of possibilities and options for action come into my mind. Show me your paths, O God of grace. And then I conclude by praying, grant me your peace, O God of grace. And I repeat that phrase too, until I feel enough calm and confidence and care to climb back down from God's lap and back into the day that is ahead of me. Grant me your peace, O God of grace. And since that spiritual director was a Jesuit priest, he also taught me the Ignatian practice of consolation and desolation. In that middle part of pondering various paths before me, praying for God to show me your paths, O God of grace, I was taught to pay attention to which of those options that came into my mind brought me more consolation or brought me confidence and peace, and which of them brought desolation left me more troubled or unsure or simply empty. And that was a helpful way to move from part two of my prayer into that piece of part three. Draw me to you, show me your paths, grant me your peace. None of those prayers instruct God or steer God to my preferred outcomes. They instead simply open me up to what God might do. So perhaps you might try out that pattern of prayer as part of your practice of lament as well, at least when words can still help and you're able to manage something more than just a deep wordless sigh. But always remember that the sigh all by itself is already plenty. Remember Paul and that midnight prayer that turned a beating into broken shackles, a dark dungeon, into a family dinner table, and a threatening guard into a new brother in Christ. Since we have a God who can do more than we can ever ask or imagine, don't worry if your imagination fails you when it comes to what you might ask for in prayer. Just pray, hold me, hold my loved one, hold your world in loving arms. Show me, show my loved one, show your world the way to go. Guide me, surprise me, keep us, bless us with your peace. And then leave the details and the specifics to God. Remember that lament is all about trust from beginning to end. Even the amen that ends our prayers says that much. Amen. So be it. As you will, Lord God, thy will be done. Amen. Every week at Emmanuel, our worship service includes a special time for children. So if there are any kids watching or any young people present, I invite them to gather near so that we can listen and learn together.
It's really good to be with all of you this morning, though to be honest, I miss you. I hope that you're doing well and you're feeling strong and you're staying healthy and that you are able to get outside and play in some of the nice weather this week. Now this morning, I want to ask you some questions. Are you ready? Here we go. Here's the first one. Have you ever had a time when you didn't know what to say? Yeah, I bet you have. All of us have had times like that. I have times like that as a pastor. When people come to me to share the things that are hurting them or making them sad, to share what it is that they're going through. Sometimes as a pastor, I don't know what to say. I'm not sure what the right thing to say is. And that, that can be really hard because I want to say the right thing to help them to feel better, but I don't always know how. But, but here's the second question. Are you ready? Has there ever been a time where you knew what you wanted to say, but you just couldn't quite say it right? I bet you've totally had times like that. Everybody I know has had a time like that where we knew what we were trying to say, what we were thinking in our minds or feeling in our hearts, but we just couldn't quite come up with the right words to say it. You know, this happens at our house a lot with Penny. Penny's learning how to share and talk and communicate more, but sometimes she's not able to really share what it is that she's feeling or thinking, and we see her try, but it we don't always understand. She tries to find the right words to share what she's thinking or what she's feeling, but, but sometimes she can't and we don't understand her. And, and I can see how hard that is for her and how frustrated that can make us feel. You know, sometimes we might feel that way with God. Like there are things we want to say to God when we pray, but we don't exactly know how. That there are things that we're feeling, but we don't have the words to share them with God in the way that we want to. But this morning, there's some good news I want to share with you. And to help me do that, I brought something from home. Are you ready? I know you're ready and excited. Does anybody know what this is? That's right. This is a stethoscope. And who uses stethoscopes? Doctors, that's exactly right. Now, I thought since we have a doctor in our house, we might have a real stethoscope, but that's at the hospital staying safe right now. So this is a toy stethoscope from Penny's doctor kit. I wonder, what do doctors use stethoscopes for? That's right, to listen. A doctor will put on their stethoscope like this and put it on our hearts and be able to listen to our hearts, to hear them beating, bum, bum. Bump, 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 bump. And the doctors might ask us to take a deep breath so they can hear our lungs as we exhale and they can hear how our breathing sounds. See, doctors use stethoscopes to listen to our hearts. We can't hear our hearts and doctors can't hear our hearts on our own, but they have a special tool that allows them to listen. And I brought along, just in case we needed it, two stethoscopes this morning because when your mommy's a doctor, you get to have lots and lots of toy stethoscopes at home. Now I brought this because our reading from the Bible this morning tells us that even when we don't know what to say to God or how to say it, God can still hear what we're thinking and know what we're feeling. That even when we can't find the right words, God knows what we're feeling and what we're thinking. And this is really, really cool. It's like God has this giant stethoscope and instead of listening to our heartbeat, God listens to all the things that are on our hearts, all the things that we're worried about and we're excited about and we're scared about and we're thinking about and we're feeling. God's able to hear all of those things. Even when we don't know how to share it with God, even when we don't know how to say it correctly, God still hears and understands and responds because that's how much God loves us. So can you do me a favor? Next time you see a stethoscope, whether it's a toy one like this or a doctor wants you to sit still so they can listen to your heart or listen to your lungs, can you remember that even when you don't have the right words, that God knows what you're feeling and can hear what you're thinking and that God always responds with love.
Now, you know what it is that we do before we finish our time together each Sunday morning, right? We fold our hands like this and we bow our heads so that we can concentrate while we pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you hear us, that with your giant stethoscope, you hear all the things in our hearts and all the things in our minds, even when we don't have the right words to share them. We pray this morning you would hear all the things that we're thinking about and feeling, and that you would help us and give us faith and give us confidence and help us to be brave and help us to be loving. God, we can't hear the thoughts of the people around us. We don't know what is on their hearts or in their minds, but we pray you would use us this week to treat them with love, to listen to them so that they can know that you love them too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us this morning, guys. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you soon. We begin our prayer time this morning with the words of Psalm 130, another of many psalms that teach us how to lament. As before, the words that you'll hear are a modern paraphrase of that ancient lament by the writer, poet, and pastor Eugene Peterson. Then, as we continue with today's prayers of lamentation, I will end each portion saying, Holy Spirit, intercede for us and invite you to respond with sighs too deep for words. Psalm 130 Help, God! The bottom has fallen out of my life. Master, hear my cry for help. Listen hard, open your ears. Listen to my cries for mercy. If you, God, kept records on wrongdoings, who would stand a chance? As it turns out, forgiveness is your habit, and that's why you're worshipped. I pray to God, my life is a prayer, and wait for what he'll say and do. My life's on the line before God, my Lord, waiting and watching till morning, waiting and watching till morning. O Israel, wait and watch for God. With God's arrival comes love. With God's arrival comes generous redemption. No doubt about it. He'll redeem Israel. Buy back Israel from captivity to sin. Let us pray. Your whole creation groans in labor pains, O God waiting with eager longing for the new creation you have promised, the new heaven and new earth where sorrow and suffering have flown away and death is no more. To be honest, we're feeling very far from that hope-filled assurance these days. If this is just the darkness before the dawn, it still seems pretty dark to us and the dawn far off. Your creation groans when we fill the air with emissions, the rivers with chemicals, and the oceans with plastic. Your creation groans when earthquakes split cities and when tornadoes scatter neighborhoods. Your creation groans when bombs reduce entire towns to rubble and human animosity exacerbates poverty and disease. Your creation groans when new viruses catch our bodies unprepared and vulnerable, when developing antibodies and cures takes so long. Your whole creation groans while you ask us to consider that the sufferings of this present time are not even worth comparing with the glory you are about to reveal to us. We'll believe that and trust that but we ask you to also believe us when we say that we're more than ready for the revealing. Holy Spirit, intercede for us with sighs too deep for words. Not only the creation, but we ourselves groan with eager longing. 
We hurt for hungry people needing to stand in safely spaced lines outside of food pantries. We groan for millions unemployed and for small businesses trying to both stay afloat and stay safe for people to be able to come and eat or shop. We worry about empty grocery shelves and then groan when we see crops rotting in fields, food processing plants shut down, and farmers needing to dump milk down drains. We hurt for sick people struggling to breathe and for families unable to visit them. We hurt for neighbors without the luxury of putting personal safety ahead of their need to earn a paycheck. We are humbled by people who willingly put themselves at risk to care for the sick, shop for the vulnerable, and to make and transport vitally needed goods. We try our best to consider that all this suffering is not worth comparing to the joyful scenes of recovery, generosity, and human kindness that also abound and keep us hopeful. It would be easier if we knew that better news and better days are right around the corner and not miles and miles down the road. You know our minds. You search our hearts. So now, Holy Spirit, intercede for us with sighs too deep for words. Help us in our weakness, O God, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. As we name those whose needs weigh most heavily on our hearts, Hear our sighs and fill in the blank spaces that we can't find words to express. In our appeals for healing and for safety and for peace, hear our deepest longings for each of these people, above all else to be blessed with the power of your love. We pray for Jane Bedard, Ethan and Harper Blumenthal, Dan Borg, Lucy and Tom Brennan, Becky Brudo, Karen Burns, Ed and Vivian Clark, Andy Connolly, Kate Connolly and Chris Gillespie, James Conway, Alan Farmer, Linda Fagan, Bill Fleming, Aaron Jingris, Betty Gustafson, Kelly Hurley, Ron Jackson, Robin Johns, Mackenzie Keogh, Sarah Kern, Jack Lefave, Pam Lano, Denise Marengo, James Meller, Joan Orton, Dylan Passo, Carmen Pascaretti, Christine Powers, Dan Romani, Jack Sylvie, Brenda Smith, Jim and Michelle Verduin, Elaine Vetter, Donna Villian, Gus Wheeler, Liz Wilson, Carol Wolf, Jim Zaleski, Don, Jill, and Pam Zitzowitz. And those we name now, either aloud or silently in our hearts and homes, Holy Spirit, intercede for us with sighs too deep for words. We know, O Lord, that in the end when all is fulfilled, when all is revealed, and all is glory, that it will turn out that all things have worked together for good for us and for all who are called according to your purpose. We know that if you are for us, it doesn't matter who or what is against us. We know that if you have justified us, nothing or nobody can condemn us. We know that nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus. We know these things because we've been taught them. We know these things because generations before us have found them to be true. This is our hope. And so, for as long as it remains a hope for something we do not see, help us to wait for it with patience and confident faith. Holy Spirit, intercede for us with sighs too deep for words. And finally, let us pray together using the words our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thanks again for joining us in worship. And thank you especially to everybody who sent in their responses to this week's question. We're going to be talking about lament together for one more week. So we're inviting you to respond to another question this week. And the question is this. When in your life did you feel most blessed by God? Now it's up to you to define blessed for yourself. But please know we're not talking about the time that you like found 20 bucks on the ground or or you got a parking spot close to the grocery store. We're talking about those times when it was clear that God was watching over you, caring for you, sustaining you, blessing you. Those are the times we want to hear about. You can send us an email and tell us about it. You can leave a comment under this video on YouTube or Facebook. You can give us a call to talk about it this week. But we want to hear from you. You, if you're, if you're listening to this, if you're watching this, we want to hear from you. Because there's value in remembering how God has blessed us in the past. There's value for us now in the present. So even if you don't send your response in this week, I hope you'll spend some time thinking. Thinking throughout the week about all those times in your life when God has taken care of you and provided for you and blessed you. Because I promise that's going to change the way you feel and are able to trust God here and now. Until we gather together, my friends, I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you, that the Lord's face will shine upon you and be gracious to you, that the Lord will look upon you with favor and give you peace. Go in peace, my friends, for Christ is with you.